My name is Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. My guest today is Dorian Smith. Dorian is a lawyer and a partner. He is based in New York City and he leads our law and policy group here at Mercer. Hi, Dorian. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, my pleasure. A long time listener, first time caller. I'm excited to be here today. <laughs> Awesome. Well, our topic today is the recent Supreme Court decision on Chevron, and specifically, we're going to focus on the implications for employer sponsor health plans. So before we dive into questions, I just want to make sure our audience is clear that this is not going to be a deep dive into the legal analysis of the decision, um, even though Dorian is a lawyer. Um, if that's what you're looking for, you should probably check out one of the um, webcasts that a bunch of different law firms have been putting on. They're usually 60 to 90 minutes long, and they'll really go into that legal analysis. So what we are going to do today, as I mentioned, is we're going to talk about what this decision means to employers and their benefit plans, um, and specifically, you know, in, in issues related to compliance. So, Dorian, um, to get started, for those of our listeners that aren't super familiar with the decision, could you just share a quick synopsis of the case? Yep, absolutely. And I'm glad that you said we're not going to do a whole legal dissertation here. Um, just, you know, as a sidebar, I was I was recently on a webcast where they were citing you know 1500s English law to determine the definition of ambiguous. And, and while it was fascinating, I don't think this audience would appreciate it that much. That said, um, so this was a case. It's called Loper Bright Enterprises versus Romando. A court case, a Supreme Court case, decided a couple of weeks ago. And what that court case did is it overturned a long-standing doctrine called Chevron doctrine issued about 40 years ago, or exactly 40 years ago. That doctrine stood for the concept that an agency, when they issued a regulation, was given deference if, and there's a two-step process here, first, if the statute was clear on its face, well, then the statute applies, the law applies, end of the story. But if the statute was unclear or ambiguous, as, as the term is, and second, the regulation that the agency issued was, quote unquote, reasonable, then a court in deciding the issue had to give that regulation deference. You know, it had to listen. Even if the court thought that it had a better interpretation of what the statute meant, the court had to say, listen, you know, agency with expertise here issued a regulation. We need to defer to it because that uh, interpretation is reasonable and we cannot assert our own judgment. Now, that doctrine has been overturned. Loper Bright overturned that doctrine. And instead, the courts have to use their independent judgment to come up with the best interpretation of a statute. And, you know, while they can look to agency regulation to be persuasive under certain circumstances, they absolutely are not required to defer to an agency interpretation. And I just, also, I just want to be clear on something. Um, this case, the Loper Wright decision and the Chevron case, neither one were benefits cases at all. I won't get into what they are, but they weren't benefit cases. But the import is that they are going to be very important in all types of regulations being issued going forward. So um, I read someplace recently that the Department of Health and Human Services actually had had more lawsuits brought against them than any other department in the administration in the last two years. So, you know, that puts this issue front and center for us and um, for employers. And so just from a legal perspective, do you think we're going to see even more litigation? Unfortunately, yes. I mean, there, there's a lot of uncertainties with what the ramifications of this decision will mean and what we'll see. And, you know, we might may not know for a couple of years how this really plays out. But one thing seems certain, and that is we will see more and more litigation from organizations, employers that are challenging regulations that they don't like. Um, we've already seen lots of litigation, even in a pre-Loper world. But now, organizations may be even more emboldened to bring lawsuits against regulations they don't favor because the regulators, the agencies that issued that regulation in the past may have been thinking, well, we can have this Chevron deference tool in our in our pocket. And, you know, a court's going to have to, as long as our interpretation is reasonable, a court needs to defer to our, regu our interpretation. And that has been cited, I believe that I've read a number 17,000 to 18,000 times 
since this Chevron decision was issued 40 years ago. That that tool is now gone from the regulators tool belt. Well, and I guess the the odds of them winning will go down, you know, as as you know, someone bringing suit can kind of shop around for where they want to file. Is that correct? Yeah, you, you would think. I mean, we again, we see form shopping today um, and form shopping just real briefly is, you know, a plaintiff looks for a, a lower court or a, you know, a district court where they feel like the judge is going to be sympathetic to their argument um, in the past. Even if you did form shop, the judge still needed to apply a Chevron Chevron doctrine. Now you get a judge who is going to be sympathetic to, yeah, maybe doesn't like a regulation, doesn't like a particular administration. We know that it's very political. And on the flip side, somebody who supports a regulation, you know, may want to have it defended in a different district. So, yeah, we're going to see uh, a lot more litigation. That's one thing we can be certain of. But other than that, it's it's unclear the uh, consequences that this decision will have. So, you know, consistency is so important to employers. It's like the cornerstone of ERISA. Yeah. And so does this decision pose a challenge to consistency? Uh, it depends who you ask. You know, uh, people who like the fact that Chevron doctrine, uh, the demise of the Chevron doctrine, would argue that there was going to be more consistency. And that's because, you know, and, and this is a truth that we often we we see agencies flip flop their regulations with a with a new administration. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples here in the health world. There's at least two or three sets of regulations, one short term limited duration insurance plans, which have flip flop, I would say three times now, Obama administration, Trump administration, Biden administration, Section 1557, uh, part of the ACA that dis prohibits discrimination based on health care. Those regulations have flip flop. We would think that going forward, agencies would be less inclined to issue a new set of regulations because of the fact they don't get deference. Um, so that would be the argument for consistency. The counter argument uh, is that it will be it will have less consistency is that now we're not going to have one set of regulations to look at. We're going to have the courts applying their best judgment uh, to interpret a statute and not just one court potentially many courts who are going to come to different conclusions about a best interpretation likely will be appealed to a circuit court of appeals and depending on the issue may hit the supreme court which will provide which will create a very long time frame for a resolution and to me that doesn't uh, result in consistency so again it depends who you ask um whether or not we'll see more less or the same type of consistency and predictability so I know we've been talking about um, legal issues and and um, you know uh, litigation related to regulations, but if we back up a step and focus on the legislative process, what are your thoughts on how this decision will impact how legislation gets written? Yep. Well, you know what I'm going to say, Tracy. Uncertainty abounds, right? But theoretically. Congress could be more prescriptive in the laws that it writes and, you know, try either brings in some specialists to help them write laws, um, tries to fill in the gaps and not rely on, you know, not purposely say, oh, let's just leave this ambiguous and let the regulators take care of it at the end and knowing that there's Chevron deference. Um, I don't know if that's practical. I, I did hear one, I listened to one webcast, if that person's listening, I'll, I'll, you get credit for this, that 1,000 page laws may become 5,000 page laws to the extent that Congress does want to try and fill in these gaps. Uh, why this doesn't seem practical is because Congress doesn't have this expertise, particularly in certain types of issues. Um, and, you know, like in Medicare or Medicaid, they just don't have that expertise. Um, and furthermore, it would slow down the process. I mean, Congress has hard enough time getting a law across the finish line. Imagine adding in such specificity that, you know, are just going to adding more to the mix that uh, the two sides don't necessarily agree on. So, Dorian, you gave a really good example around the flip flopping that we've seen. Right. But what is you know, what are maybe another example or two of specific areas where employers might see a change given this Supreme Court decision? Yeah, so 
I guess there's a handful of regulations on the health side that we would expect to see challenged, even in a pre-Loper world, uh, but certainly are going to face a, an uphill battle in a post-Loper world. Um, and in no particular order, or maybe in a little bit of a particular order, uh, the mental health parity, substance use disorder, non-quantitative treatment limitation, final regs, which are sitting at OMB now, which are quite contentious, um, a lot of opposition to those regulations, uh, some support as well. Uh, we expect to see those. Um, those are so, those again, those are going to be challenged anyway, but now with no Chevron deference, they're going to have a more of an uphill battle to get across the finish line. Uh, a couple of others that come to mind are the Section 1557 rules that prohibit discrimination in healthcare, uh, particularly with respect to the definition of sex and whether that includes or does not include gender identity. Um, Preventive services, ACA preventive services, that's always an issue that's uh, being litigated and can, is currently being litigated. We could see, you know, those three and, and potentially others uh, being challenged and knowing by the plaintiffs that there's no Chevron deference anymore. A um, little bit tougher hill for the regulators to climb in to support those interpretations. Yeah. Do you think we're going to see changes in how the guidance is issued? from the regulatory agencies? Like, I know you and I have talked about sub-regulatory guidance. Sure. You know, do you think that they'll sort of change their approach? Quite possibly. Um, you know, in our, in our world, our health world, our fringe benefit world, um, we see lots of sub-regulatory guidance. You know, I can think of the ACA FAQs that started back when the ACA was passed in 2010, and I think we're up to FAQ 60, something like that. Those don't have the force of law, but they're very instructive and plan sponsors pay very close attention to them. Regulators pay very close attention to them. We as consultants and lawyers, we pay very close attention to those. Um, those have never been afforded deference under a Chevron analysis and could have always been challenged. Uh, but yes, I, I suspect that agencies may tend to rely on those types of pieces of guidance as opposed to regulations, they're quicker to get out. They don't go through a formal notice and comment period. Um, the other thing is we may see more enforcement. I alluded that a second ago, but you know, the agencies just may feel, okay, we're just going to enforce the statute or enforce a set of regulations that are out there. Whether those regulations get challenged or not, we're going to enforce. And that often achieves what the regulators want uh, from an employer, you know, from a plan sponsor or, or, or a plan administrator. Sure, the threat of an audit. Sure. Yes. <laughs> so, um, Dorian, what's the call to action for employers on this? Yeah, that's a, a great question. It's a sixty-four thousand dollars question um, for those of you that makes any sense to. Uh, and the call to action is, you know, your day-to-day -day business activities is not going to change. Your your administration of your plan, your plan design, um, that's not going to change overnight over week, over a year. Um, so there is nothing that you need to do today in light of this Loper Bright decision, in light of the Chevron doctrine going away. However, um, the one thing that I would suggest is to the extent an employer, plan sponsor, industry group was not closely paying attention to, lit to litigation, you know, you want to monitor that even closer than ever because that's where we're going to see the change in policy, the change in administration. And we're going to see that, again, across the country. And so to the extent that you, uh, an employer is interested in challenging a regulation, maybe they do it on their own. Maybe they enlist a trade group to do that. Um, but that's where the real call to action would seem to be is focus on litigation, participate or not, but pay attention. So our blog subscribers already know this, but um, the group that Dorian leads, our law and policy group, has a regular section in our blog email every week. And that would be a really good place to keep an eye on for news about upcoming litigation um, and things that you might need to know and pay attention to related to that litigation. So um, that was a great opportunity to make a plug for the blog, Dorian. So thank you so much for, for joining me today. It sounds like in addition to tracking litigation, we might have um, 
much more longer uh, laws to read through and longer preambles to yes. regulatory guidance. Um, sure. And so a lot, a lot to look forward to, but thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your expertise. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me.